Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Community Matters. Uh, we're talking to our chief scientist, Mike DeWert, today about the current crippling enumeracy. I'm going to leave it to Mike to actually define that term, and then you get a handle on what we're talking about here today. Hi, Mike. Aloha, Jay. It's good to be here. Good to have you. So uh, what, what is enumeracy? This is, uh, this is a term that we haven't heard much before. Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically numerical illiteracy. It's the fact that people uh, can't do basic numerical reasoning and which I consider a failure of our educational system. It's like people who buy lottery tickets because someone has to win, never mind that the odds are one in 42 million and uh, you know, they don't have 42 million weeks of life ahead of them in order to actually have a shot at winning. <laughs> Well, but that, you know, isn't it also the press, uh, because if the press says, for example, uh, that, you know, we have some, uh, you know, side effects going on here, and let us tell you about the, the ones that, that, will, that will train your heart and your emotional stability about all these terrible side effects, that you're going to see that as a greater number, even though it may be only one. Right, right. It's uh, also we have this algorithmic curation of information where if you click on something shocking, the algorithms feed you more stuff like what you clicked on. So it's just, ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah, people don't want it, to. It's hard for the average person to just go ferret out the real information, uh, ferret out the reliable information. It's, it's very difficult. So it's understandable. We've got this crazy, you know, amplification of rare side effects and amplification of relatively rare breakthrough diseases. Um, if you take the trouble to dig into the numbers, you, for example, New York State, they have about 9 million unvaccinated people, 11 million vaccinated people, and they started looking at the rate of cases that the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated people get of COVID-19. And it turns out that if you're unvaccinated, your risk is 30 times higher. Um, which is in line with the vaccine efficacy, 97% reduction of risk. So yes, you'll have, you know, when you got millions of people vaccinated, you'll have some people for whom the vaccine fails or doesn't provide sufficient protection. But the overwhelming, overwhelming benefit is that the vaccine protects people from the disease. Like I say, a factor of 30 difference in risk. There's really two sides to this enumeracy. One is that you ultimately are not rational appreciating the data you know, mm -hmm. as a human condition, uh, especially when you have a country of 330 million and a world sure. of 7 billion. It's hard right. to get a handle on what that all means. This is a demographics is what it is. It's data in the, in the, in the billions. Um, but the yeah. other part of it is, is something you just mentioned, and which I would like to dwell on just a little bit. And that is the echo chamber of social media. So if, if I, if I, if I, I'm in a certain group or I click on a certain a certain link, then I'm going to hear it again and again and again, even if it's a really minor point. And uh, that, that way, not only am I not completely rational about the, the, the information I'm getting, but the information I'm getting is weighted uh, right. for me. Uh, right. and perception would, you know, probably be, oh, there's more of this than I thought. Yeah. And there's confirmation bias. You tend to click on the stories that confirm your pre-existing biases. And so that further amplifies the problem. And, and then there's unscrupulous people who have an interest in sowing discord. You know, you can imagine the Russians uh, uh, sitting behind their computers making bots that will amplify information to confuse the American people about uh, the vaccines, the efficacy of the disease. And, and you see the same thing with elections, you know, where they, any little flaw they find that's amplified, oh, this confirms there was massive fraud, when in fact, this true statistics show there wasn't. Um, and you know, I don't want to pick on you know, any one political affiliation. No, you can pick on the Russians if you political. want. I don't have to go a long way to imagine the Russians are actually doing that. Right, uh, right. You know, go ahead, pick on them. It's okay, Mike. <laughs> Yeah, but we see this in all kinds of things. So we see it with investing, where people think that they can uh, pick the winner stocks, pick the 10 baggers and uh, come out way ahead. And when statistically speaking, stock picking doesn't work, and when you dispassionately look at the numbers, you're better off picking an index fund and sticking with it. You'll end up in the 
top quintile of investors if they do that. Um, that's been shown time and time again, but people still think that they're smarter than the statistics. So I think, for example, that I'm an average stock picker, which means I better not pick stocks and rely on it for my retirement. I better go into index funds. I'm an average driver. I know I'm not better than the average driver. So I just try to be careful when I drive. Most people think that they're better than average at driving, mm. at stock picking or whatever. And they'll click on stuff. Well, anything that confirms their self perception as better than average at things. Um, and, and it reminds me of uh, Garrison Keeler in yeah. Minnesota Public Radio, where he said, here we are in, forget the name of the town, uh, where all the children are above average. Right, right. All the men are good looking. <laughs> right. All the women are good looking. All the men are strong. All the are above average. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 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 And um, this, and this, this kind of enumerates this inability to reason numerically, you know, even is effective in court cases. There's something called the prosecutor's fallacy, where, say, a cops find some evidence, say, a blood stain at a crime scene, and they type the blood, and they say, oh, there's uh, only one in 100 people have this type of blood. Oh, we got Joe Smith here who has this type of blood. Therefore, there's only a one in 100 chance it wasn't Joe Smith who did this crime. But then when you look at a city the size of Honolulu with a million people, a one in 100 rate means there's 10,000 people that have that blood type. So really, Joe Smith's I'd risk of being the one that was the culprit is one in 10,000, not 99%. And so that's a common fallacy that you hear in courtrooms. Now, that's a very, that's an exaggeration of the prosecutor's fallacy. They've gotten smart enough to do it more subtly now, but it's something that can easily trip up the unwary. Um, this kind of statistical reasoning, we don't teach people to think statistically. It's not natural for us. You know, we, we, it's natural for us to imagine the worst, like that shadow in the dark. If it's a saber toothed tiger, really, you better know it's a saber toothed tiger and be ready. If it turns out just to be some shrubs, okay, no harm done for making a mistake. But when there's billions of us and interacting with thousands of people in our cities or millions of people in our states all the time, then the statistics start to become important and we've got to learn how to think statistically. Well, you know, it wasn't too long ago that the 300, billion pe 300 million people in a country was an awful lot. And there weren't many places around the world that had 300. You know, I read recently that in the time when I first came to Honolulu, there were 500,000 people here. That's yeah. it, a whole state. And it's, you know, it's nearly <laughs> triple that now. Those were the but, good old days. Yeah, they were. And, and, the, and the good old days meant that this kind of, um, what do you call it, uncertainty about what the demographics were and what the probabilities were, um, you know, we, we, it wasn't in the same degree of, 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 of a problem. Um, and now, though, just as we have more people and perhaps more diversity or more people in a divisive mode, which makes it harder to calculate what's going on, we also have artificial intelligence and we have the data, we have the numbers. And, you know, that, that leads to the question of, uh, so the average person uh, or maybe below average person has no clue about the real probabilities here. Right. And worse yet, he's being mis misled. We should spend some time on that. But um, yeah. a person who is um, you know, familiar with AI, a person who is familiar with data, like a scientist, would take a, a whole different approach at looking at the macro numbers. And so right. if, if I were, I am not, but if I were a data person, a scientist person, an AI person, um, I would look at this, I think, differently. But can you articulate for me how I would look at it differently? Oh, if I was, if I was not innumer enumeracy. Enumerate. Yeah, you, you would think about it in terms of um, natural ratios, natural likelihoods. You, you try to, part of the problem is we don't teach statistics very well. We teach all this highfalutin theory that, you know, a Bayes theorem and all that, that's very difficult to conceptually get in your head. But if you do things like say, for example, if you want to know if you get tested for the COVID and the, and the test is 99% accurate, 99% specific and 99% sensitive, meaning that if 
if you have the COVID, there's a 99% chance it will show you have the COVID. If you don't have the COVID, there's a 1% chance it will show that you have the COVID falsely. So now you have a million people, suppose you just you personally, randomly, just random, out of the blue for no reason, and you test positive. Well, you, do you have the COVID? Well, you have no clue. I mean, if it was smallpox, you know the risk is zero, because even though the test was positive, we've eradicated smallpox, and we haven't eradicated COVID. But so now you need to know one more piece of information, and that is how likely is it that the average random person in the population would have the COVID? And say it's 2%. Say 2% of people have the COVID. So now you take a million people, 2% of them, like 20,000 people, have the COVID. And so if you test the population, um, something like uh, 99% of those people, 19,800, would have the COVID, which test positive. So you would have that. But then you test the other 900,000, 990,000 with a 1% chance, 9,900 9, would show the COVID. So now your risk isn't that 99%, it's the 9,900 that are false positives out of the million people versus the 19,800 that are true positives are about two to one. You got about a one in three chance. Even if the fall, even if you test positive for the COVID or the 99% positive accurate test, you have about a one in three chance of having the COVID. And we don't teach people how to do this natural reason. And it's hard. It's hard to get used to it. Oh, it is hard. It's hard with you right now. And I'm sure anybody listening, you know, I hope he's making notes. Um, but you know the is I should have drawn the, a picture. It's okay. It's okay. You make the same message. Um, you know, but even even that, it seems to me that the the media who pronounces these numbers has a duty to explain them further. And and yeah. when they give you a raw data kind of uh, probability and they right. don't explain what that really means, they're right. a they're lazy, b they're ignorant about the real the real world yeah. of numbers and see they're they're really they're really confusing people and so i think the media has a duty to lay it out in more what do you want to call it understandable terms and you know and it, it could be also that there's a, there's a science here of doing that of laying it out in understandable terms we're giving right. you the raw data but the real probability is um, you know and then people won't won't be misled won't right? be misled. yeah yeah and you know it's it's easy to blame the media because they just throw these numbers out, then they move on and don't do any analysis. But they have the same educational problem the rest of us have. They've been taught statistics badly. They don't really understand and they don't have time. They got to move on to the next story. Um, but then they never go back and correct the record. That's what really bothers me about the media. Once they are informed of their error, they never go back and correct it. You never hear a retraction. Um, and these kinds of this kind of statistical reasoning is why they pay consultants in courtrooms to defend people or prosecute people one way or another using statistics. You have to explain to the jury in words the jury can understand what the statistics really are. Um, and it's the same thing with, say, in a different walk, cancer patients. You got to explain to the cancer patient, okay, you have this test, it's positive, here's what these numbers really mean. Uh, such you don't unduly scare people, but you also don't unduly give them uh, false hope. You know, um, it, it's an it, art form. It's really an art, art form, and I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of uh, doctors uh, know how to do this. They know yeah. how to present it in such a way so that they, you know, they're relaying the, the raw data numbers, but they're also explaining uh, right. so that so that everyone is on the same page, and so that you, you know, you don't have a, a, a error as a result. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking also that, uh, and that, and that's the simple solution, if the data that we were getting was, in fact, true, you know, we could deal with that, we could have the media explain it further, we could bring interpreters like, like expert witnesses in, in cases in court cases, and have them explain, which to some extent, the media do that, in my view, yeah. not enough. And Sanjay, uh, be your doctor. Hey. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you got to pick your doctor about which one you're going to believe. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, uh, like your view of this, is we have seen, even till right now, till 20 minutes ago, uh, when Nevada changed its mask rule because uh, 
uh, because uh, the CDC changed its mask yeah. rule. Uh, but not all the states have changed their mask right. rules. Um, and so what you get is, um, you know, do I, do I listen? Uh, is what, what happened in Nevada, is that persuasive? What happened with the CDC, is that persuasive? Um, and if they change it all next week, you know, uh, I saw one of the cable shows uh, where uh, Tony Fauci was being interviewed and they said, um, you know, you, you were, you, now you say you were wrong before, what, why should we believe you now? Yeah, that, I, I, that's an unfair question. Yeah, and of course, it's a moving target, right? Yeah, being a rational scientist, I would imagine that Fauci would say, well, people will be honest about their vaccination status and mask up if they're not vaccinated. Um, turns out people aren't honest. They, they'll just, you know, if nobody's checking, they'll do what they want. Um, you know, they may underestimate the risk. They may think they're invulnerable for some reason, but they, so, Turns out that really you got to have a mask mandate and just to make everybody do it because there are people who will just lie, <laughs> and and that's that's a science too. That's part of human nature. You have to understand that people will lie in order to gain some kind of advantage or not lose a privilege or not be stigmatized. So if the government says okay everybody wears a mask, then that, that's great. You everybody will wear a mask when they're together indoors at the very least. Um, yeah, I went to a yoga class Friday and I, uh, I'm vaccinated. I thought everybody in the class was vaccinated, but then uh, I get out and I read the article. It says that the Pfizer vaccine is less effective against the Delta COVID than against the other. Them. That was a dumb thing to do. I shouldn't have been in a room with a bunch of people, masked or not. <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 and that there'll be more like that too. There'll be more of these things that you know fly in from nowhere. Yeah. Um, and that was one, but there'll be there'll be others, and so yeah. much. Um, you know, I I would make the distinction between disinformation, which is intentional mm -hmm. uh, or grossly negligent, and misinformation, which is just you know mistaken, uh, yeah. confused. Um, yeah. And you know, and that's the problem when you have a, a, a dynamic like it's changing. From week to week, the curve is going here and there, and um, and and the information is is being interpreted by different people and different organizations. And then you know, Trump's one of Trump's worst mistakes. And trust me, Mike, he made a lot of terrible mistakes. Um, it was to you know, pawn this off on the states. Yeah. It would yeah. have been so much better to say to the CDC, "We believe in you. Tell us what to do. We'll follow it." And in fact, have sanctions. I mean, that should have been clear at some point along the way. It's clear now. Um, and instead of with, with this 50 states, 50 different liberty and in information, information, liberty, meaning you don't get straight information. Great. Um, so, you know, that was a big problem. And it still is because it is the culture of, of the response to say the states, the states will have their own view of things yeah and and unfortunately there there's states now where they're actually deliberately like shutting down the reporting process they've stopped reporting daily case rates going to weekly case rates or deliberately seem to be trying to hide the information um which is very unfortunate there's um there's i've read about schools for example in florida where the principal said any teacher that gets vaccinated is fired beautiful it's, it's just incredible, it's, incredible. insane, insane. Um, or, or, or Tucker Carlson saying, uh, if you see a child in the, in the street wearing a mask, uh, report him to the police, report his parents to the police. That, that's child abuse. Yeah. yeah, we have a a privileged culture in the United States where people think they're invulnerable because we've never had a major catastrophe. We're not one of those poor third world countries where these things happen. You know, in the third world, just people screaming to get the vaccine because they're dying every day. There's more people that di have died this year than died last year. It's not happening in the United States yet, although we're heading for a third wave. We're going to have a third peak in October if we don't do something different. And um, and, well, and we're going to. That's a big question. Well, well let's go to uh, let's go to this question. I, I meant to ask you this weeks ago. You know, uh, you talk about. Um, people remembering 
Um, we'll talk about the, the news, the media looking forward, but not back. Right. We're not effectively back. All right. I have this recurrent dream, Mike, that we used to have travel. Remember that? Matter of fact, you and I talked about it. We used to Several have what? Times. Tracking. Tracking? Well, I'm sorry. You're, you're having the same kind of amnesia that I am. Uh, this is when you identify somebody who has a disease, um, mm -hmm. and, and then you ask him, where have you been? Who have you oh, been oh, with? Back tracing. Okay. Tracing. Yeah, tracing. Okay, yeah, okay, sorry. Tracing. Thank you. I know, it's going back. It's going back in history. It's right. a year or more ago. But all this consternation about you're not tracing, tracking, right. you're not doing enough of it. And we have all this technology, and there was this scandal at the Department of Health here in Hawaii. You're using yellow pads to write this down. And you have, yeah. you know, like very limited number of, re of people who are yeah. doing it and they're not doing it very well. And we, we need to have more of this tracing. You have to trace yeah. every case. Yeah. Whatever happened to that? It disappeared. Well, I, I don't I don't know. I can't talk to the Department of Health um, how they're doing. But right now we're getting 200 cases a day in Honolulu, in Hawaii, in the state. That's low enough that you should be able to do contact tracing. I mean, you should be able to trace the contacts. You should be able to get people to isolate. And um, we, we should be enforcing it. Um, you know, you, you, you can require truck drivers to rest after they've been driving for a certain time. You should be able to require people to go home and isolate if they've been in contact with a COVID patient. Um, how, how do you do that if you, how do you do that if uh, they haven't taken a test and right. uh, they're not likely to take a test until they're sick? But, but by the time they're sick, they will have spread it, especially here in the reopening. You know, two hundreds of people, thousands, who knows how many. Um, mm. So, that, you know, if you, if you, even if you have no symptoms, you can still be shedding the virus all over the town. Yeah, right. I mean, the choice should be: um, you've been, in, we know you've been in contact with a COVID patient. We can't tell you who it is, but we know you've been in close contact with a, somebody who's tested positive. You need to either get a test or self-isolate. That can be the choice, um, mm -hmm. and then they until they get sick or I, or until it's been so long that they don't have the COVID. Um, that's well, you, know, you can go down to CVS, Long's, yeah. or any of the other drugstores, and you can get a test, and you can yeah. take it home like a pregnancy test. It's, <laughs> it's just the other end, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you can find out all by your own self, you know, whether you've been tested. The point is that it's cheap or free. It's immediate. Okay. Back to free. <laughs> right. And so, uh, you know, I don't know what the problem is. If, if, if I said to you, okay, you tell me that you don't want to, that you don't want to take a vaccine. We can get to the mand mandated vaccine in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you don't take a vaccine. So, all right, just bring me a, a current test, you know, like a week old, maybe or less. And then you can get in and do your job at your desk. But if right. you can't take a vaccine or show me by a test, which is cheap or free, and hopefully it's set up so it's documented for the date, yeah, the date of the test, and the yeah. person, I suppose, you want to be comfortable about that. Um, yeah, I'm glad you, the okay. University of Hawaii is doing this. Say it again? The University of Hawaii is doing exactly this. They're saying if you want to come to class in person in the fall, you've got to either be vaccinated or you've got to take a test every week. So let me ask you, can we get to that? Let me ask you about the vaccinations. You know, we have 100 million people in the country who are hesitant. And, and the pressure is growing on them, or at least theoretically it is. But we still have 100 million people in the country. And they're a danger to us all. And, yeah. and they, they're, like, they're like stone walls. You can't, you can't get through to them. Uh, and there's, there's very few places where they're paying a price. I mean, I, I think it's probably going to be more the case soon about, you know, you can't take a train, you can't take a plane, you, you can't you know, go to class, you can't go to work, all that. It's easy enough to do that. The federal government could issue national guidelines for this, but it isn't. Um, and so, um, you know, is that where we're going on this? Is that where we should go on this? 
Um, and, and if so, and here's the real question, if so, how do you distinguish between somebody who has got a, a legitimate reason out of those hundred million, it can't be that many. We can get into enumerology again on this. Out of that hundred million, <laughs> how many are legitimately um, threatened, uh, you know, medically by taking, mm -hmm. by taking the vaccine and how many are not? I would venture to say that the number of people who have legitimate reasons for not being, you know, vaccinated, tiny. That's not very scientific, but it, I believe it's tiny. The rest of them have no real reason. And yeah. so, the, how, but how do you make, how do you, where do you make the cutoff? Uh, well, they, they can have a doctor's letter from a, you know, an MD, a licensed physician saying they have this condition. I mean, that shouldn't be hard to get. And now in France, if you want to go to an indoor event, a concert or something like that, you have to show proof that you've been vaccinated. Now they're having riots in France because there's people who don't want to have to show proof they've been vaccinated. But, you know, that, that might be where we have to go. Now, I, I hope not, because one of a couple of things are going to could happen. You know, it could be that we'll just give up on it and the disease, the Grim Reaper will take his toll and we'll end up with, you know, another million Americans dead. I mean, well, we're closing in on the 1918 toll. We lost 650,000 Americans in 1918. We're at 638,000 or so now. We can hit 650,000 in October if we don't, you know, start tamping this thing down. And then it could keep going because of the unvaccinated people and the virulence and contagiousness of the Delta variant. The Delta variant seems to have a natural in of six instead of three if you if nobody's vac if nobody's vaccinated and nobody's masking. And that makes the Delta variant almost as contagious as measles, which is scary. Way more contagious than, than the alpha variant. Yes. Yes. By, by multiples. By the way, I was thinking back to my Greek history. And we get alpha, we get beta. We haven't we haven't heard too much about beta uh, COVID. Uh, we have the next one is gamma. 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 We haven't heard too much about much. that. I'm not sure why not, but we haven't. Uh, okay, now we have delta, alpha, beta, delta, delta, delta. Um, gamma, yeah, delta, or delta, right. gamma. Although I know up to, up to lambda now, I don't know. If, okay. how many there is a lambda, but it's not as, as contagious or as lethal. Um, but yeah. there could be another one and another one and another one. And my question to you, just oh. my personal concern, is if we have delta and it's wrecking havoc the way it is, <laughs> in this country and other countries, um, it, and we have more cases, doesn't that increase the, the back to enumerology, um, doesn't that increase the likelihood of, a, of another deadly yeah. mutation? Well, yes. And American, so, American yeah. only, American yeah. exceptionalism, there you have it. Yeah, so that's why we're seeing these new variants in places where the vaccination rate is really, really low, like where the population is high and people are crowded, like India. Um, it, the, the more people who have the disease, the more likely it is the new mutation will arise. And, and the next mutation could come from Alabama. I don't know. Um, the uh, governor of Alabama, I think, was just started urging people to go get their vaccines. Uh, she's tired of this. <laughs> I mean, so they're coming around finally in, in, in certain parts of the United States that have been resistant before to realizing that they have a responsibility to save their save their voters, you know. Um, but um, I, I blame Trump for all of this. I'll tell you why. He politicized COVID oh, yeah. and he politicized the vaccine, although he ultimately took it. Um, yeah. And he, uh, he made it, was, it was, even in late in his term, he was talking about is akin to the flu and sniffles and what have you, a million different reasons that he used to politicize it and, and poo poo it. And, um, and you know, my theory is the momentum theory. Once you convince the people about something, once the demagogue sells a package like that, it's likely to stick around. And yeah. so all this resistance now is a direct result of Trump's machinations, no? Yeah, it could be true. I mean, there's a saying that the, What's more, what's more difficult than convincing people, what's more difficult than fooling people is convincing people that they've been fooled. Not true, because they, they're invested. They're invested in being suckered. 
in the first place. Um, yeah. they, they don't want to admit that they've been suckered. No. Yeah. So let's talk about um, disinformation, about the motivations and the recipients. So we know that, um, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin would like to, um, you know, sow di disinformation here and everywhere in order to divide, you know, create divisive uh, yeah. groups, sub communities, if you will, in this country and elsewhere, because his view of it is a zero sum game. And if I can make you weaker, then I'll be stronger. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we know his motivations and we can make a pretty good guess as to whether he or people acting under his auspices are actually doing that. Uh, you referred to it earlier, and I think they are doing it. But mm -hmm. what about all the others? You know, there are Americans, and actually not too many of them, um, mm -hmm. who have huge uh, influence in the social media and are responsible for some of this. Why do they do that? What, what gets them to do it? Well, that's, they're incentivized, you know, in the sense that the algorithms reward you for the more clicks you get. You put up something shocking and scary that gets a lot of people clicking on that disinformation. Well, you get credit for it. In some cases, you get money for it. So um, it's, it, it's, it's algorithmic amplification of disinformation has really distorted our whole information economy, the whole system. And then there's people who you know, they may not really believe the stuff they're saying, but they know they can get a political advantage, you know, curry favor with somebody else uh, by successfully peddling disinformation. Um, we've seen that before in history. And we've seen people who go against their own social classes uh, interest to promote their own self-interest um, doing things like this. So it's human nature. Yeah, it really, and human nature takes us to Jonestown um, and people who uh, drank the Kool-Aid. And yeah. uh, it's quite remarkable that at some level they knew they were killing themselves, but they were doing it for Reverend Jones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we got to try to hope that our better angels can, um, can prevail. I mean, you do have some people like Liz Cheney who are saying, look, this is truth. You know, I, I may not agree with the, the Democrats about much, but I agree that COVID's a problem. COVID's real, you know. Um, well, any, so yeah, yeah. Gary, but let me ask you this. You know, it seems to me that if somebody intentionally um, proliferates, and that I include social media companies, by the yeah, way, yeah. Um, the misinformation that results in, in sickness or death. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, when you compress it all in, a, in the 21st century, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a world of billions of people, um, if, if somebody pervades information that leads to death, that person is responsible for the death. I, I, yeah. you know, I don't think you have to go to a leap of logic to come to that conclusion. Yeah, that, that's... You have a free speech issue, but yeah. Um, well, free speech is only is only relevant if the if the federal government, bound by the Constitution, you know, uh, is trying to affect free speech and the press in in the marketplace and the public. But if it's uh, if it's you or me, uh, and we had a relative just just bought that line and then died, uh, even in a red state. Uh, or bought a government official telling him or her, yeah. um, you know, or, or, you know, somehow drank the juice, so to speak, yeah. um, then that person has a claim. And right. it's, it, it's, not, it's not a governmental claim. It's a personal cause of action, or possibly right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a class action. Civil possibly. suit. Yeah. A civil suit. And that's yeah. not a First Amendment question at all. Yeah, and then the question is, how do you win? Because you got to, prove that the person may the a that you, i've identified the source of the disinformation b that the source of this information knew it was wrong and peddled it anyway um and did so with some kind of malice you know that's a very high standard unfortunately well it depends on where the jury is if the jury is in new york state that's one thing if the jury is in you know old home alabama that's another thing um, but if you put you and me on that jury, I don't think I'd spend a whole lot, lot of time deliberating. 
I would say you either knew or should have known that that information was wrong. You knew or should have known that that information would reach, you know, this person. You knew or should have known this person would die or be seriously injured by the disease um, right. and would, would rely on the information. I mean, it's a it's a classic case of fraud right. and damage. Um, and well, I, I don't know if this happened. Well, I definitely you know, defer to you on this. I mean, you, okay. you practice law. Well, I'm so. just wondering if anybody's doing it because the government really can't or shouldn't get involved in First Amendment, you know, attempts to control speech. Uh, and that includes Congress. Uh, although, I mean, I, I don't know who would object, actually, if, if Congress said something about you can't proliferate misinformation, you can't do that. Uh, you know, people are dying. When do well, we reach uh, the point where Congress takes draconian action? Uh, is it 600,000? Is it a million? Is it 2 million? Right, right. Yeah, and then, then they've got to amend the Communications Decency Act to repeal the section that shields internet companies, social media companies from liability for disinformation spread on their sites. It's just too easy for Facebook to say, oh, hey, we, you know, we're just, the, we're just the conduit. We're not responsible for the content. It's like, um, at some point, when your algorithms are amplifying this. It's your algorithms amplifying who gets these who gets this information so you bear responsibility for it um, yeah and they're forever boasting how many billions of people are, are uh, looking at them and watching them and being influenced by them so if yeah. if, the, if that indeed is so and i think it is so uh, then they're responsible for uh, showering these people with misinformation this is, this is a great test of the human race yeah it, it is and, and you know I don't know if we're going to do any better than we did in 1918. You know, the people who went through this flu epidemic in 1918, they when it ran its course after several waves, they kind of wanted to forget all about it in a lot of cases because they behaved shamefully. You know, you had husbands and wives who would refuse to take care of each other because they were afraid of catching the flu. Um, you, you would have families divided up by this. Um, You'd have neighbors who would, you know, just shun their other neighbors. Instead of helping, they would say, oh, go ahead and die. I mean, or, or they would just refuse to take precautions because they didn't want to have their ability to make money interfered with. So people behaved shamefully in that pandemic. A lot of people are behaving heroically now, but also a lot of people are behaving as shamefully as before. And sadly, we also saw this with the plagues of the past where in certain cities, the vigilantes would nail the door shut of the people who had the plague, and they would starve to death inside their homes. Um, Tragic. And it's, um, it's a dehumanizing experience. Yeah. So the question I put to you here at the really the end of our throw, Mike, is um, uh, you must have some ideas. Mm. Uh, and maybe they're changing ideas, but at least this snapshot in time you must have ideas about where this is going and more important, when is it going to end? And uh, how's, you know, how is it going to end? I, I hate to sound pessimistic. I, I think Hawaii, we have a shot at getting everybody, enough people vaccinated to where we can shut down the pandemic. And there's certain other states that do, but I think the United States as a whole, it's going to end when enough people get sick from the disease there's herd immunity from illness. Then we'll have a huge overhang of long COVID cases costing our economy for decades. So we're gonna see, you know, another, we're gonna see tens of thousands more deaths in the United States before this thing's over. And then when it's over in five years, you know, if we don't get a new wave that's different from Delta um, and escapes, evades vaccines and evades immunity, um, People will want to forget all about it, forget all about how they did. Um, healthcare system will have been scarred and crippled. Um, and people will be dead. And people will want to say, oh, no, we're, we're not responsible for that. Let's just forget about it. I said, bygones be bygones. It's like, uh huh. I mean, it's yeah. no different than slavery. Um, oh, what bygones be bygones? That was 200 years ago. No, they're still suffering from, you know, the consequences of slavery are like long COVID and centuries 
of repercussions and side effects and, and pain in our society. And that's what we're going to have with the cases of long COVID, not centuries, maybe but decades of people suffering from this long COVID and crippling uh, long-term effects, heart weakness, et cetera. And I, I can't be optimistic. I, mean, I can try to do what I can to get people around me to vaccinate, wear their masks, take precautions, um, urge other people to do that. Um, I mean, I have relatives in the Midwest who are right wing who just don't believe that this is that bad. They don't think they should have to mask up to go to school. I'm like, do you really understand the risk you're taking? And then they'll end up like the case you were talking about in Missouri where the guy was screaming for the vaccine after as he was being intubated because he couldn't breathe on his own anymore. It's like it's too late. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the other the other part of this is, and it's worth another discussion is that when you occupy the country uh, in, on this issue, and indeed, if you, you know, watch television, read oh, the yeah. newspapers, uh, you know, this is what the country is occupied with. And this issue is sucking all the oxygen out. Um, you, you undermine political will, you undermine, mm, you know, democracy, if you will. Uh, and worse than that, Mike, even worse than that, is that we aren't spending any time on climate change. That's right. Uh, we, we really have to do that. We have to get back to that. We're not managing this. You know, it's like the rats are running in the store uh, while the screen door is open. How about closing the screen door? <laughs> and, and on top of it, it's going to exacerbate income inequality. You know, people who rationally get themselves vaccinated, they have investments, they're, they're going to take advantage economically while the rest of the country is distracted and make a profit. It's like the hedge fund manager, you know, last year, early last year, he made a huge bet on the market going down and he got information about the COVID and he made a billion dollars. Or maybe it was more than that. But it was a huge number, but it's several billions of dollars, I think. And so while well, everybody's preoccupied with this debate over whether the COVID is real, you're going to have people who are taking advantage of that chaos, even in our own country. And, and, and I'm not saying that it's always wrong. I mean, it's like in the sense that there are people who are going to invest in the market, seeing the trend, even though they have no risk. I mean, it's not their fault. They're not trying to hurt anybody. They're just saying, well, this is the trend. I better put my money in this part of the market. So, so they'll get richer. And the people who are having to, who can't get away from having to face people, who have to go to work every day in a food service or something, taking these risks every day with their lives, they're the ones whose income is going to be cut because they'll either have to quit their job to avoid the risk or they have to stay home and take care of their kids because they can't put their kids in school to take the risk or they have to stay home and take care of their elderly parents because elderly parents can't be put in a nursing home because of the risk. And the poor will just get poorer and the income equality will just get worse. And that's the other consequence of this long COVID in addition to our long-term problems with climate democracy, we'll also have long-term problems income inequality. And income equality leads to a deterioration of the supply lines. So even if you have the money, you may not be able to get a loaf of bread anyway. Mm. Because the people who bring you the loaf of bread are the ones who put their lives on the line in yeah. in, in the food store. El you would hope yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. Well, yeah, Mike we DeWert, our chief scientist. Um, I, I think I'm gonna have a drink now. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm not feeling a lot better. <laughs> no, make Thank it a you, Mike. <laughs> oh, yeah, <maybe> fine. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Mike. We'll do okay. it again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.